Let me show these suckers how to ball out here. Oh, man. Let me get this together here. Oh, layup. Oh, shot. Oh, three. Three. Oh, it's like Brick City out here. Mid-range. Oh, my goodness. I can't buy a bucket out here. I missed the whole damn basket. Oh, my goodness. What's going on, man? My game is looking trash. Rat. Oh, here we go. Black Power Media shirt. Now we cooking. Now we cooking. Tree. Tree. I'm taking all three of y'all with these right here. Between the legs. Oh, my goodness. Behind the back. Layup. Oh, and did he just do a reverse? He is in beast mode out here. I ain't got to look. It's falling. Oh, my goodness. This guy is going. Three, two, one. Kobe. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. Nice. Empower yourself. Go get me some of that Black Power Media again. Right here, Black Power Media Top 4. Yep. Saturday with Renee. What's up, good people? Welcome back to another edition of Saturdays with Renee, featuring Renee Johnston. I'm Jared Ball. This is Black Power Media. What's up, good people? What's up, Renee? How you feeling? What's up? I'm good, Jared. What's up? What's up? I can't call it. It's wild out here. <laughs> I just saw for the first time this morning uh, 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 a lion head, a half lion head breed rabbit. What? My daughter is volunteer. You know, she one of my youngest wants to be a vet, uh -huh. veterinarian. So, so she's doing service hours, working, volunteering at a local rabbit rescue. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and uh, and I just was walking around. You know, obviously we're not just dropping her off anywhere. So I was just you know getting the lay of the land and checking it out. And I had never. And I was like, what is that? Because it looks like a little dog. And. and and that's it's like a, a breed of rabbit. It's a, it's a kind of rabbit that I had never heard. I didn't even know they got like that. And it's it's wild. And she is the uh, partner of uh, my daughter's favorite rabbit, Carl. And and they got to stay together. I didn't know that about rabbits either. You they they're very yeah. social, and I didn't yes. know all of that. Yes, so yes. That that's what I was up to this morning. Getting my my. <laughs> I do know that rabbits taste like chicken. <laughs> oh, Jared. <laughs> well, they served it to us in the Navy. It's not my fault. I didn't know any better. They served us rabbit. And and and, and it tastes just like um, chicken. It, uh, see, I feel like those are the things that make people vegans. <laughs> Yeah, because I was looking at Carl and Mabel. I was like, how can anybody eat y'all? It was like, you're so cute. Oh, oof. Oof. Anyway, what's up, good people? Uh, and shout out to Lawbrarian. Congratulations on our 25th show. That's right. I know. I know. I can't even. Yeah. If it's something that was like a random, let's do this thing. It's... <laughs> I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I'll just say thank you to, to you and to everyone else. And thank you for the invite. Thank you. Uh, but and I so will we, not thank you for making me watch this. I'm no, sorry. <laughs> yeah. You know what, though? It, it, I, needed, I needed to be joined. And the only thing that's going to save the audience is I don't want to get BPM in trouble. So, you know, you can't share Netflix stuff because people got paid for their Netflix right. watch things. So we can't watch no clips, but. No, we don't have any clips, but I'll at least pull this up here. So we have a little graphic representation of the monstrosity. Right. And that, then I did, I, I did put the the link to the, uh, to the trailer on our run sheet. But, but okay, before we get to that, let me. Okay, let, okay. okay. Yeah. First, first things first. So I want, last week I promised everybody that I would look into this title six thing. And mm. I did. So there, row nine on our on our run sheet is a link to the Federal Education Investigations Bureau thing, right? So this is where you can go to look up and see which schools, school districts, yada, 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 are under Title V investigation. 
And it says pending um, cases currently under investigation at elementary, right. secondary, and post-secondary schools, ed.gov. Okay, right. Wow. So right. you can look up by discrimination to see. So as everyone knows, there's some wild stuff going on in all kinds of school districts. So I was just curious to see like, huh, you know, what, what kind of stuff do we have going here? So if you look oh, at, damn. yeah, so this is wild. So it gives you all of this, but you can actually narrow down. If you go to racial and national or like the next, the next drop down, you can select religion as an mm. option, I believe. Mm. Because what we want, Involving we want the religion, title six. Yeah. Yes. We want the title six. Right. So this is what's happening. But what I want people to understand is how out of control this has gotten. So if you zoom in even more and you search from January 1st to December 31st of 2022. All right, I'm sorry. Hold on. I, I'm just trying to see how that works here. So you said which dates? So do January 1 of 2022. January 21 or January, just the, the start of the year. Of so I want people to see the differential of how this has gone. So if right. you do 2022, so January 1st, 2022 to December 31st of 2022. No, that didn't do that. That's not what I meant. If you click on the little calendar, it might be faster. To be yeah, that's to what I was trying to do, but it didn't. Oh, it's not and you said so from January 1st, 2022 to when? To the end of the year, just do December 2022. Because I want people to understand how this has changed over time. Because it's uh, it's wild. So no, over it, here. Why does it keep? <laughs> Sorry, I was. You know, it's <laughs> yo. All right. No, that's not. All right, so I'll just I'll just explain it. So from January 1st, 2022 to December 31st, 2022, there were 16 cases pending by the government regarding Title VI concerns in school districts. 16. So I want everybody 16. to hold on to no 16. One six. 16. <laughs> mm. Right. Then I because I, I was just curious. So I searched it up as I always do. So then I checked from January 1st, 2023 to November 1st, 2023. There were 19 cases. You following me? One nine. I am following 19. you, even though so, I can't get this thing to cooperate. Right. Right. We can share the link and then people can try. I, I don't know why That's it's crazy. giving you the business. It, it won't, it, it, it just won't go off of this date. I can't change the date here from oh, so from whatever that is. Um, and I didn't know if I shared it with like the search in there if it would work. So that's why I didn't I didn't do it that way. But so so we went from 16 in 2022 to 19 in 2023 up until November. From November 1st to now, there are 79 pending cases. 79. Mm. So for me, and this all, this all flows into us really not comprehending how things work here, right? Because I have my, what I feel like is a fair assumption <laughs> of why this is happening. And it's because of Palestine, because I know a number mm. of the, the school districts on the list are on the list because of anti-Semitism, because that is what is now, you know, being grossly misrepresented and, and conflated with anti-Zionism. And so when I see that over the years, you've had 16, then 19, and then now in, what is that? What we're at the end of March. So we're looking mm -hmm. at five months 
<laughs> you have 79 pending cases. 79. That's wild. Wild to me. And so I know that there is a lot more happening behind the scenes with how the government is coming after you if you are not talking the talk that is acceptable by the government. So what I also shared on our little spreadsheet is the line under that FBI for Facebook. And this was shared with me this morning. Thank you, Franny French. She sent this to me and I was like, oh, stop it. You have got to be kidding me. So there's a link to an Instagram um, video. Yeah, I think she sent this to me too, so. And because I had yeah. been doing all this, looking into this title. Can nine, we just move him? So play, go ahead and play it. Or do you want to set it up? Do you want to say? Oh, yeah, anything? we can. Yeah. So, so the reason for me this was really important is because it's all linked to the same thing, right? So this video is essentially what happens when a Muslim woman who is an American citizen is approached by the FBI at her door because of her Facebook feeds. So I know for a fact in multiple school districts that the school district, the board of education, the administration, the cops, the um, local um, Zionist group or whatever is coming at the teachers and students who speak pro-Palestinian language. Mm. Right. So this is this is what is now happening, like on the streets anywhere, apparently, if you speak pro-Palestinian language. So you can go ahead and play it because this is. And I, I know Goldie Patrick. Shout out to Goldie. I think she just got married. Congratulations. All right. Here we go. Uh, so that's dope to see her there. Can we just move in front of the house so the dogs don't go crazy? Yeah, we can. I need you to identify yourself and let me take imagery of your IDs. I'm not gonna say my credentials on the phone. Um, so you said you were with the FBI? That's correct. And why won't you show me your credentials? We did. I, I, I didn't let take a look at them. I said, one second, I'll be right back. Are you gonna show me your credentials or yeah. no? Yeah, we did already. So, and we identified ourselves. So, what we'd like to do? I didn't look at your credentials you. again. Well, I we, didn't verify them. I, w I told you to wait, and I went inside. Okay, that's correct. What we'd like to do is just have a conversation with you about some social media posts that you've made. Would you be willing to talk to us today about that? No, I would not. I would like you to later talk on with my lawyer. Okay. Do you have identification you have card cards? No, no. I'll get back to you. Okay. All right. You might just have your attorney uh, contact the FBI office in Oklahoma City. What's the number? What are the names of the agents? I'll go look for you. So you're refusing to identify yourselves? No, we've already identified ourselves. Again, I did not take a look. Okay, so the phone number for the FBI in Oklahoma City is 405-290-7770. Okay. And tell him that Facebook flagged me for posts. Uh, Facebook gave us a couple of screenshots of your account. Okay, so we no longer live in a free country and we can't say what we want? No, we totally do. That, that's why we're not here to arrest or anything like that. We well, you can't arrest me for freedom of speech. We live in America. Exactly, so it's kind of weird that you want to come talk to me about me exercising my freedom of speech. You do this every day, all day long, talk to people. Okay. We've got no reason to believe necessarily that that's you, and that's why we just wanted to have a conversation. So do you that. have a conversation with everybody on the neighborhood? Uh, do you have information with anybody else in the neighborhood? Is I mean, anybody? all I've done is exercise my right oh, no, as an American citizen on a public social media platform with my personal opinions. Yeah. Correct? Okay. Well, Mo true. Most of the individuals, right, in America, especially older generation, right, have Facebook. Are you questioning all the citizens in America? We, we certainly would if we had any, any sort of concerns. Okay, so you have concerns about my personal opinions? If you don't want to talk to us, then you can... I'm definitely not going to have a talk with you. Well, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for your reach out to us. 
Okay, they're so-called FBI. The FBI don't they don't do black trucks anymore and all that? Is this the new FBI with a does that even have a government plate on it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> this is Rola Abdel Jawad in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This is America. That's messed up. Uh yeah, the I mean, only thing I think I disagree yeah. with is that mm -hmm. she she said that she exercised her freedom of speech on a public social media platform. Right. These are not public. They're right. private, which is another part of the problem. But right. Yeah. So that's the only thing. But yeah, that's wild. It's wild. And this is what's happening. You know, I think people, I think this is probably happening more than people understand. Um, there is definitely a push from all ends of government um, to shut people down who are speaking about Palestine, who are um, presenting the realities about what is happening right now to the Palestinian people, um, who use the term colonialism, genocide, uh, apartheid. I mean, I, I, I was in a room weeks ago where people are still saying using those words are racist. <laughs> and so, you know, it's it's crazy. And, and I know, you know, people in the chat are saying that folks are saying those weren't real FBI agents and, you know, but no matter, no matter what the reality of that situation is, she still had three strangers knock on her door represent themselves as law enforcement, ask, try, attempt to ask her questions, right? And whatever, whatever the reality is about what that situation was, who the people are, anything of that nature, that is not a comfortable place to be in, right? Like I, I can't even imagine, she did a really good job of like just staying calm and not wigging out and answering the questions and all those things. But, you know, a lot of people would not have been able to be that calm. Right. And what if that results in shots fired? Like so many things can go wrong <laughs> in that situation in a place where law enforcement acts with impunity, where they do whatever they want. Right. And say whatever they want. And we have to address that. And people need to understand that this is something that is literally happening. Like, as we speak, this is happening. So. Yeah, I'm not. I, I mean, and e even if they I, I don't get that they were actual agents either. But even if they whether they are or not, it, I don't think any of us would think that if they were that that if they were that this would be somehow a surprise is, right i guess the point i'm getting at uh right. but uh yeah and she did very well to to try to get them to to re-identify themselves and uh yeah that looks sketchy very so. the whole thing was very very like what's going on right now <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh yeah all right. So. All right. So we can we can we can go to the actual propaganda piece now. I just wanted to make sure no, yeah. that I uh, one explain to people like how crazy things are in schools and the expansion of silencing what is supposed to be a system that's set up to allow people to critically think, which I don't even want to get into that contradiction. <laughs> and then, you know wild 
Oh, what's well, you got Ole versus Adams? What is oh, that? They're, they're, I, listen, didn't, I missed that. Because you know I'd be messing you up on Saturday mornings, my yeah. bad. But so oh, all man. of it's all related. So do you want to start with the trailer first? It's up to people? no, it's up to you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pull that up. Yeah, whatever right, you want so, me to. Yeah. So I, this I'll, also uh, just so everybody knows, this whole conversation started because I started watching this docu series on Netflix, and because I can't, you know. I can't suffer alone. I sent Jared a text literally like halfway through the first episode. And I was like, you have to watch this. You have to watch this. So this is the trailer for the new Netflix docuseries that is produced by the makers of Law and Order. Mm. (laughs) And available now on Netflix. And is like the number three series, by the way, on Netflix, FYI. And so, yeah, I made Jared suffer through it. And now y'all are going to suffer through the trailer because that's the only thing that we'll be able to actually show. <laughs> was an evil crime. They're on the floor with two bodies. All shot in the head, execution style. I can't imagine laying there, hearing the shots go off, knowing that you're next. Mystery surrounds a gruesome murder of a man in New York Central Park. The murder rate was off the chart in New York City. Probably worked on 1,500 murder cases. Every single case takes a little piece out in her soul. I don't think I've ever wanted something more than to get justice for those people. This was a fierce, emotional attack. You can't shoot five people in New York. They're gonna hunt your ass down. They're gonna find you. (laughs) Y'all, they are so good at propaganda, man. I can't. So the reason, I mean, one one segue for me is that the reason why either people would be accustomed to not do what the sister did that we just saw a minute ago, or to try to f- either either become the state or mimic the state is, mm-hmm. I think, a lot driven by this kind of stuff. Right. Uh, right. Oh, I'm just I, seeing the comment. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, it is. I mean, that's that's perfectly stated. Mm-hmm, that's perfectly mm-hmm, stated. Mm-hmm. Um, it is. Mm-hmm. It's propaganda at its finest. It really is. And so, one of the reasons that I really wanted us to talk about about this specifically, and what I actually text Jared was the next episode should be the myth and propaganda of policing, <laughs> because I felt like that fit perfectly. Um, because this is this is the fight that we are currently in right we are literally fighting against every media movie making television show series making documentary making newspaper writing um press release everything that is telling people that policing is a good thing right Police are there to help. Police are there to solve crimes. Police are there to prevent crimes. The the visual of police, you know, make spaces safer. Um, you know, all of these things are built in in order for regular people to continue with this belief that police are there to help that they are there to serve and protect, that they are there to help with that, right? So Ricky asks, how is propaganda being defined? Mm. And I define it as the public presentation of policing that convinces people that policing is there to serve a positive purpose. It is to move people away from the understanding that every study that has ever been done thus far proves that police 
very rarely actually solve crimes, right? The percentage is very, very small. I think of that that 50 year study, they found that like 2% of crimes were actually like, quote unquote, solved. And when you consider the the rate of people who go to jail under false, <laughs> under false accusations and, you know, bad trials and all the other things, even that 2% you have to question. It yeah, is I'm your, sorry to cut you off. No, it's okay. Just, just real quick, but John Oliver in his 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 uh, HBO critique of the series uh, said that the that uh, that the main cop in SUV, Law and Order SUV, uh, who was considered, I guess, a, a superhero by many in in pop culture, the the main male character, uh, is said on the show to have a 97 percent uh, conviction rate and the reality of those kinds of uh, sexual and violent crimes being solved in New York is actually 6% according to what John Oliver said uh, in my review of that show for today so similar to what you're saying right. broadly speaking I mean they're just lying up and down the, the thing but exactly. I'm sorry, please no ahead. no but that I mean that's the whole purpose right is they want they want you to get away from the realities of what the studies physically prove about policing. And they want you only to look at policing as this, this brave group of people who are out there trying to fight crime and solve crime. And if this is what you watch and you take in and you don't watch it with a critical eye, right? They're, they're very, they're, I mean, I have a whole list of things that, I heard and saw as I was watching this, oh, like yeah. I went back and, you know, kind of scrolled through to find specific things that if you're not watching this series with the eye of someone who understands what copaganda is, it would be very easy to take it in as a positive instead of understanding that they are literally telling on themselves throughout this series about how they actually treat people. Right, what the reality is of this system. So, um, yeah, I just I wanted just, us just, to dig into it because I, I was just quickly, away. just because I think Ricky it raises a good question, and I'm actually good with in general with the with Wikipedia's definition here too of propaganda, uh, propaganda efforts to shape public opinion about police or to counter criticism of police and anti-police sentiment. Uh, I think that's a good simple. Yeah. you know, summary and, yeah. and I, that I, you know, so, but yeah. Okay. Where do you want to? So there's just so much. <laughs> there yeah, really there's is. a lot. There's a lot. Do you want to start with your article since it's a review of, of the sure. show? And, it's, and, it, yeah, and the one it. I found that I'm going to share perfectly summarize, well, maybe not perfectly, but not, no, let me not, let me scratch that. It does a, a good enough job in, in, sh you know, um, summarizing my own criticisms uh so from reality blurred homicide new york is pointless netflix garbage from dick wolf and top chefs creators so so we get the top chef contributions as well and where are my notes to do, do 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 but essentially yeah so i'll just go through find my highlights here so although i don't feel like are they showing up i mean because i see them okay there we go. First of all, I wanted to just stop on this woman's photo here because I thought that uh, uh, Barbara Butcher, and that's really her that's name. A, that is a great name. It's a great name. She's the medical examiner. Mm -hmm. And uh, throughout, and as it says in here, I think they have the line about it. I got it from here. So I'll come back to her. Just remember her face because because she'll the, the, the perfect line for her comes up later in the article. So... Aside from it being garbage and an overview, here's some of why, uh, and I think this is a good summary from the article as to how they do what they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing. So the same footage is used over and over again uh, should be a clue that there wasn't much here, uh, meaning that they're, they're, they're doing the most is part of what the article is saying, that is Netflix to find content, to produce something quote unquote new, uh and to to get clicks so from this article's perspective and this is where we would part their primary focus is just on attention they don't really deal with the cop again and the politicized aspect of it but 
Uh, that footage is not so much graphic as shameless. A person who eventually died from a gunshot to the head being loaded into an ambulance is shown over and over. Crime scene photos of other people bound with duct tape also shot in the head, covered in blood, flashed on screen again and again. Just in case that's not enough, the producers have also bound an actor's hands in duct tape to get n- get nice close-ups so we can see the actor shaking in mock fear as a gunshot flash goes off in the background. That's played while the victim who survived his gunshot to the head talks about what happened. This is not what I'd call centering a victim or their story. Because that's not the point. Now, now, and this is the victim. Uh, the, the point isn't to center the victim. The point is to center the propaganda, which is where I would depart from this article's exactly. focus on the mm-hmm. clicks and whatnot. Um, uh, should that not be the and then so then they make a point here that they show us this was a slick part too this this big white dude Rob Mooney who's a gr- Grateful Dead head mm-hmm. uh, and he always wears the Grateful Dead pin on his lapel even mm-hmm. when he's told he shouldn't he he defies people's criticism of it and uh, and he says that he that he's he's quoted as saying that he doesn't judge people based on experience and in mm-hmm. fact what he's but that's used to explain to people that you shouldn't judge him as not being a cop <laughs> just because you see him at a grateful dead show right. so that was slick right, right? that was right. slick right Mm-hmm. But then the, the author of this article says correctly, should that not be the cornerstone of policing and not required a deadhead status to comprehend? If if but again, I think the author missed the point that they were making that, that how they were using that in the series. Because yes, of course, theoretically, all of us should not be judging books by their cover, so on and so forth. But they're using that to catch unthinking liberals, I think. To, to to say, oh, you know, and not really alerting to the, that, that, A, they will be often in your crowds undercover, mm-hmm. and, and, and B, that just because I'm a hippie dude don't mean I won't bust your head open and, and, and take you to jail. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, but then here we go. Uh, remember the woman picture, Barbara Butcher. One interview subject, a former medical examiner, is kind of a character I wouldn't believe in fiction. She speaks in dramatic sound bites. Sound bites. They're going to hunt da- hunt your ass down. They're going to find you. The evidence doesn't lie. People do a lot. Uh, and I noticed the same thing that, that I was like, you are really performing. Like you want a job for real, or you think you are in a Dick Wolf TV series as opposed to what's supposed to be a docu series. Cause she did talk a lot like that. Uh, homicide New York gives the people who've done this work the most screen time, but it is not interested in interrogating or exploring their work as detectives or medical examiners. So I thought that was a good point. Again, mm-hmm. we don't agree on the details, but that is true. They're not interested in interrogating what cops are doing, what medical examiners are doing, mm-hmm. what all is going. They're not interested and I, in that. I will, try- and just yep, real quick, ahead. I will point sure. out that we just discovered, what was that, two weeks ago, that the golden star of DNA testing was lying exactly throughout her career and falsifying she was lying for years. her studies, giving bad information, deleting stuff if it didn't help her case. Like just, you know, just, just a reminder, just a reminder. That's it. Uh, so just wrapping up here, it says, you know, it, the, the series has no insight to offer, no new information, no commitment to perspective that would help us understand either specific cases or the people involved. And again, I think that's exactly right, but that's not the point. The point is just to promote all of these folks as, 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 as and, and the, the institutions as, as not just justified and necessary, but, but almost angelic and heroic, uh, and then this author notes, by the way, that they that some of these stories that are in this series have already been on reality TV. So mm. so they conclude here that even if homicide in New York isn't direct plagiarism, it's lazy and uninspired enough to look like a show that just switched some words around and call it a day. So it's it's not only on one of the most popular digital streaming services in the world. It's not only, as you said, very popular. It's not only uh 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 uh, plagiarizing and uh not even centering the stories or the victims it is doing all of that in the service of promoting the police as again heroic and and Mm -hmm. truly special wonderful people who even cry renee i know they had to do talking about he was in tears that tough white boy he was like i was in tears like 
over these cases. Yeah, yeah. It was so what so here part part of the reason that I really wanted to have this conversation is and and, and I said it when Hiram was on and I I will never forget him talking about this, you know, that the reality of what it is like to live in an area where there is crime makes it so difficult to have real conversations with people about the realities of policing, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, shows like this make it even harder because you are really fighting a hella battle about this because people are so, as people are so brainwashed by it all, right? And it's in everything, right? Um, when I talk to Wise the Zone, and I said to him, like, yo, if you think about the amount of things you have watched over your lifetime, that even if it's not a cop show, right, even if it's a regular movie, regular TV show, whatever, right, something happens, they call 911, the police shows up, right, like, it's, it's built into everything, and we have to find a way as people who are trying to have these conversations with people, how do you, how do you combat this? Like, how do you fight this battle and have conversations with people who in everything that they've experienced throughout their life have been told an alternate story about what actual policing is about? And so part of my pursuit with this was to provide opportunity for people to use something that is indeed propaganda, copaganda, as we like to call it, but to show people how it's copaganda, right? Like how they're using this to brainwash you into believing that police are something that they actually are not. So I have like a list of things that happen throughout the series that, you know, and I really wish we could show clips because I will say this is one of, you know, I, I actually disagree with the article. I think this was phenomenal propaganda. It was, for, I mean, the video, the... No, it's good <laughs> propaganda. It's, it's, the the it's article well is only done. saying it does not a, does a bad job of not centering the victims or even get investigating what the police do. But uh, the issue but is, yeah, but, but, yes. that, but that within itself is a problem because that's not mm. the point. It's not mm -hmm. going to do that. Right? right. The show is not going to do that because that is not what it is set out to do. The okay. show is set out to pretend as if police do a particular job. That is literally not what the police do. Literally not what they do. And so, you know, I just it, it's it's mind boggling. So just a couple of things you all can play along with me. So in episode one, this is the the, the shooting of the, the, the four people above the, um, the deli. One, the first thing I thought of was, that's funny, y'all doing all of this for a drug dealer? <laughs> mm. did you, like, did you think that? Because that's well, literally- Well, that's not what I took it as though, um, uh, ultimately. I mean, I think that's how it turned out. I took it as they were doing this as because this was a white woman in Manhattan, right across the street from where where David Letterman and them shoot, you know, shoot their. Um, so this is what we're talking about the the this case here, the Jennifer right. Stahl uh, but, shooting in two thousand one. So that's but, the way I took it. Yes, but yeah, go but ahead. Let's, yeah. But let's be clear. You think they did not know that white woman was selling drugs out of that apartment over <laughs> over that deli? Of course they knew. She was doing it for years. Years. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Right? But her clientele were actors, directors, musicians, right? So it, you know, so so it wasn't going to be a problem until a shooting happened there. Right? I see what you're saying. Yeah. This yeah. like if if this was in the middle of a black neighborhood and it was a black person selling to other poor black people do you think he they would have been getting away with it with like <laughs> right like oh no they wouldn't have been getting away with it and, and 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 what i misunderstood you to be saying is and i also don't think the case would have gotten this level of attention either right that also right and so that was the first thing that kicked off for me was oh wow okay that's what we're doing okay <laughs> right 
But then as they go through how, you know, how they figured out who the people were and the still shots and all these things, they start telling on themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So they're talking about what happened when they got the first dude in to ask him questions, right? And they start talking about how long they had them in there, had him in there questioning. And they, like, one of the people literally says he was in there for a long time, for hours. We had to get a fresh team of people who slept all night to rotate in. Like, I'm like, did anybody catch that? That the man was in a room for such a long time being talked to by police officers that they were able to rotate in teams of people to come and speak to him, including people who got a full night's sleep. <laughs> right? Like, they t they're telling on themselves. And people have to, saying, you yeah. understand what I'm saying? Right and people on. have mm -hmm. to be able to look at this and say, see, what they want you to think is how dedicated they were to getting mm -hmm. the story. What they don't want you to oh, understand the is they were going to get the story no matter what they were doing. Because they mm -hmm. were going to keep that man in there for days if they had to until he could, until he, he admitted to something. Right? I mean, that to me is wild. And then the woman goes in and they love her. She's throughout the whole series. The Spanish. Butcher? <laughs> no, the Spanish cop. Oh. Whose name I'm not, I don't even remember. Right? Yeah. Like, so they bring her in and she goes in and she's like, y'all want to get, let me take a try. Right? And she's all excited to get into the room with the perp so she can ask him her questions because, you know, she has a way of getting real personal with people. And she, this is a quote. She says this. That that people have said that she quote smiled in my face and stabbed me in the back. Mm. That's her talking about what mm. other people have said about her after she has interrogated them. Because we mm. all know that cops lie, and that it's legal mm. for them to do that. Right. By the way, just so people, if if you see this, the the woman. Uh, here, uh, the the second from the left yes, is the one that is you're her. talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. The the the. But she was she was not the only. We can come back to him, but she was not the only so called world majority or so called people of color. Oh, no. Cops. No. I got a whole. Old boy list, was, I got a whole yeah. list. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. Old boy was. Right. Oh my goodness. And so you know, so that within itself is something that I think that. If you really want to have conversations with people who are under this, that you're trying to dispel this myth, right? Part of what we have to do is be able to look at what they are telling you and how you can extrapolate the reality of the situation from that storyline, right? So you can watch that that part of the episode, right? And and if you're not looking at it and understanding how copaganda works and what they're trying to tell you, really and truly take it as like, this is how cops get the story. This is how they get the truth of what happened, right? I mean, he even breaks down like, you know, the steps to a confession. Like, you know, first they weren't there, then they were there, but they weren't involved. Then they were like, literally, like this is how they go into a room to talk to people. So if you walk into a room with a plan of, getting the person to tell you what you already think is the truth. Are you really getting the truth or are you getting the thing that you were pulling from this person because you've held them in a room for however many hours with multiple people talking to them, right? And then the last person who comes in is the woman who like convinces you that you remind her of her brother and, and that's why you suddenly decide that you're gonna tell on yourself, right? I mean, that's a lot. It's a lot, but you're only gonna you're only gonna understand it if you if you really take the time to pull out the truth from what they're trying to sell you. <laughs> no, absolutely. And if if you it, it, I was thinking if you don't go into this already with the frame that 
this is propaganda. This is going to be abusive. This is going to be framed a certain way. Uh, it it is designed to do everything that you're just. I mean, it it, it it will be effective. I think in convincing those who are either you know unwitting or uh, unwittingly paying attention or already on the fence or just of a certain liberal conservative politic that I mean it, that that the police are i mean this was this this doesn't even include any of the 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 flawed dramatizations that we see of cops in shows like law and order where you even you do see some flawed behavior you see the 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 cop struggling with his fidelity or struggling not to be over overly violent or whatever their little drinking or whatever whatever their issues are but this this doesn't even have that these are all tearful heroes putting in all the time all the energy not wanting any case to be cold uh it's remarkable it is yeah it is it really is so then we'll skip to episode three. And I, so I looked for certain things and then I didn't want to get too out of control because we couldn't show clips. <laughs> so, cause, Cause there's, I mean, there is a lot. There's, re- I mean, there's, there's, there was just so much. And, and back to what you just said, like really being able to look at these things and to understand like what they're really trying to do with this. Right. So in episode three, we get the brother who grew up in the hood and decided to be a cop <laughs> and who went back to school and, and got doctor. his PhD. And now he's teaching at John Jay College because, you know, that's the cop college, the, the, the CUNY cop college. And I mean, he really. Did you write down his, if you were, if you were take, making quotes, did you write down what he said? It, oh, I, it was, oh, I did. I did. He, I mean, he, all right. So he starts off by talking about growing up where he grew up in New York. And then he says that he used to see the New York police department as the biggest gang in New York city. He said, that's a quote. But what did he say? They and already? then he says, but it's once I join quote, it's more of a family. And people do and not, the graphic, they don't have, they don't have enough of an understanding of what police do. It's not the graphic a at that moment, force. No, I'm sorry to step on that. Yeah. Read that again. <laughs> people don't have enough of an understanding of what police do. It's not an occupying force. This is the, the black dude who used to live in, who lived in New York and decided to become a cop. And who just understood. And the graphic while he's saying this is it, it, that part about family is him hugged up with his white fellow officers. Yep. And then what I took, I when he said that line, it's not an occupying army. An occupying force. Occupying Quote. force. Mm-hmm. I did take that as not only a direct shot at more recent activism, but I took that as a direct shot at Huey and the Panthers. Who, right. For me and my sort of generational whatever, that that phrase was popularized by them, that right. they're an occupying force, an occupying army, co- colonizing us the way that, that, that the military would colonize. Although in the Malcolm X comparisons of the 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 police do locally what the military does internationally. That right. So I heard that line. I was like, yo. These right. much like Barbara the Butcher, as I'm gonna call it, Barbara the Butcher. <laughs> They, I can't stand you. <laughs> they, they, they're using that language. Like they're talking to 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 Dick Wolf, like they're on a TV show. Right. They're 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 following. This is if anything's ever. But yeah, go ahead. I because I, there's more. This dude, he he wasn't done. No, and he went into a whole thing about how he teaches now at John Jay and the importance of getting people to understand that. You know, they also can't see community members as animals. I mean, they right, right. I mean, he did a whole they they dedicated a long span of time to this black man talking about his path from living in an over police 
under-resourced community to becoming a cop, to leaving the force, to getting his degree, to now teaching people how to become cops. I mean, they spanned his whole thing in that little that little piece that they did. And it ended the episode. So, like, on top of everything else, like that, like that, like that's like the, you know, that's like the 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 cult, the, you know, like it, it's the closure, right? Like this, it, it oh. his whole purpose, he said, of getting the PhD after retirement was so that he could bridge the gap between the police right. and the community and teach the community that the police shouldn't be judged by whatever negativity they're associated with and the community mm -hmm. to the police shouldn't be judged negatively either and that we should all see each it was it was that same kind of thing that the hippie dude was saying that right and and his that was his goal in it was showing that the police are not the enemy and showing the police that the people that they police as the enemy and as you've brought to this platform through exposing the actual training they really get Right. You know, so so whoever he's talking to in the class, in those classes, he's not talking to the ones going to, to those New Jersey led training sessions. And, and well, those, not yet, because uh, they're still they're still well, in training, right? They well, haven't gotten well, their costume okay. or their gun yet. Well, I was also thinking he's talking on. I, I wasn't clear that I thought he might also be talking to just sort of quote, quote sort of quote unquote regular college students, but who who wouldn't get to wouldn't see the cops get to that but either way you're right but the right. point is the training still is there waiting for them right to say whatever he was talking about nah it's nonsense <laughs> right right and you know it's it, it's I, I know i'm sorry that i had to do it to you and i you know i i really i i struggle I struggle with things like this because I want people to watch it, but I don't want people to watch it and to get sucked into the nonsense. I want people to watch it with that critical eye so that they can say to themselves, why did they put this particular person out there to do this piece of this particular series? Like why pick the black dude who grew up in Brooklyn or wherever, where, wherever he grew up that was an under-resourced and over-policed area in New York to tell this story about his transition and how he's now, because they want you to believe that this is what, what learning to be a police officer is actually about, right? They want you to believe that when you get, when you go and you take your criminal justice classes, right, that it's about treating people fairly and understanding your community and the importance of family and all these things, right? But they're not gonna talk about the amount of police gangs, not just in New York, but all over the country that are literally the criminals, right? They're not gonna talk about the however, I think it was almost 2 million people who were stopped in, in the 80s and 90s by this stop and frisk policy in New York City that, that, that Mayor Adams has now brought back, that when they just did a study, it's back up to 97% of people who get stopped are black and brown people, right? They're not gonna talk about how it was the black and brown officers who had to who asked you know who had to to turn around and and really blow up this quota system that existed in New York right they're like they're not going to talk about any of that stuff as they as they try to tell you this fabrication of a story about what happens when you're actually training people to become police and what actually happens when you know, when you join a police force and, and what you're actually taught about people, they're just going to give you this, like, you know, this pretty, pretty picture, right? Told by a black man who grew up in a poor, underserved, over-policed community. And it's all intentional. It, it's, it's yeah, wild. it was, it was mind boggling. And and they found in him the perfect uh, antidote to to uh, a lot of what we're we're trying to do here. He this 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 is he's the one. 
Right. So, and that, and that, and the, and and really not just the one, but he reflects an attitude that I know they're cultivating among other Black and Brown uh, communities, and uh, uh, with the goal of of negating what again what we're collectively trying to do around here. I mean, it's crazy. It, it, it is. Was, it was. It was very, very wild. Right. Um, so well, what, you had something. And, well, just one other thing, by the way, that that John, I'm just looking at my notes that John Oliver in his uh, uh, HBO breakdown about the history of law and order made one other point that I, I hadn't thought about that, that I should pay more attention to going forward is that Dick Wolf got his career starting as an ad man. He's an advertising guy. So it reminded me of him being sort of the white male version of my problem that I have like with Ava DuVernay and, and others who want to come into these spaces, but they're coming from that public relations, advertising, marketing background. Um, in fact, they talked about how Dick Wolf was the, the creator of the, the once upon a time famous in the or 70s, I believe, ad campaign of, of having scantily clad women uh, uh, in bikinis, uh, promoting airline travel as flight attendants and with the, with the tagline fly me. So it would say like, hi, I'm Jane and hi, I'm Cheryl fly me anytime you want fly me anywhere you want. Wow. I'm always ready to be flown fly me. Like that was like, and he created, so, so, and and in 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 a clip that Oliver shows, he's being interviewed. That is, Dick Wolf is being interviewed about this history as an ad man by Fox Newsman Roger Ailes, the 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 late king of inappropriate sexual assault and whatever behavior in the workplace in the news sp space. And even Ailes says in the interview. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't lose your job over those ads. Like even he was saying those ads were pretty. <laughs> and this is Roger Ailes. So so my point yeah. is, these are the people. This, this is the worldview producing so much of this content <laughs> that has been on for so many years. Decades, uh, man. Decades. And they've got multiple versions of it, too. So it's just. And he's saying and 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 he's saying how dick that is dick wolf i am pro police that's why they even talked about how most of the the cases that you see on that show at least the original show i don't know about the other ones that they were talking about most of the defendant he said that's why you saw such a, a prevalence of defendants from the upper classes because i actually used to note this when i watched the show and he said they do that because he it was done intentionally because if all you saw were cops chasing down black and brown people like they do in real life, you might actually get a negative attitude about them as the average citizen watching the show. But if you see that they go after all these rich folks too, uh, it makes it easier for you to see how great and 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 mighty they are. So it's all right. there. I mean, it's 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 very well thought out and slick from an advertising perspective, which I think, again, is a euphemism for psychological warfare. And that's what we end up getting here. So, so this yeah. new version is some. It's something. It's something. <laughs> so, yeah, watch at your own risk or watch with your with your appropriate political frame glasses on. Right. And be and be prepared to have these conversations, because I think that's the part of it that I really I want people to key in on. Like when you have conversations in your spaces, in your communities, with other people, with, you know, with whoever you have to be, you know, you have to be mindful of this is what they're being bombarded with. Right. This is why people call 911 for every little thing that happens. Right. Because they are under the belief that calling 911 is the thing that you do in order to respond to anything that makes you even the slightest bit uncomfortable. Right. This is what you're that this is what we've been convinced to do over years and years and years of of this literal propaganda about policing. So so the next thing that I thought was interesting, and I didn't write down a quote because the whole 
piece of it, as they were going through that murder of the four <clears throat> people, they went back to your girl, the butcher, and <laughs> she was talking about the science of gunshot wounds, right? And she was talking about how the, the person who was accused said that he was afraid and he actually, the first murder was by accident. He was scared, his hand was shaken, the gun went off, he shot her. And then because he was already afraid, they shot everybody else because they were hoping to like just get out. And she goes into this whole thing about how you can tell based on the entry wound that he was not afraid and that he had the gun held a certain way and that there's no way he, I mean, and she physically does the hand, like the fake handshaking to show in her mind, like how, you know, the entry wound would have been different if he was actually afraid. And all I thought to myself was, so you mean to tell me that months after the shooting happened, right? You were able to go back to your notes about <laughs> how the entry wound looked. And from whatever you wrote down in your notes about what the entry wound looked like, you were able to tell what was happening inside that man's mind at the moment when the, the gun shot happened. And you know why we have to take her word for it? Because they don't tell us anything about the damn case or why the people At were all. there in the first place. Right. I had to go look that up on another video. Like, right. why, I was like, wait a minute. You, you're saying a house full of people, two people bust into a house full of people and shoot the place up and steal stuff or whatever. And there's no discussion of who did it, why they did it. What right. does it I was like, going back to your initial wait, point. Right. And they glossed over it. They glossed over the fact that she was a drug dealer. I mean, they, I mean, they literally like, they didn't say it like that though. She was just selling no, them some weed. She was she selling, was selling marijuana. Them some weed. She was, she was selling my marijuana. And, That's not and a drug was, dealer though, Renee. I, right, right, right. In, in the 1980s in New York city, a white woman selling drugs to rich people is not a drug dealer. Boom. Like I, make it make sense. Make it make sense. You have people literally doing decades in prison for selling weed. Make it make sense. So this is this way, is what I right. I was gonna say we are making it make sense by putting it in the context of copaganda. Because <laughs> right. otherwise it's just you Can't. just get an article where it's just another bad TV series. Nah, right. nah. <laughs> and it's you know, it, it's something that people have to look at it and understand that this is, you know, this is the version of the story that they want you to walk away with, right? That the, the person who did the medical examination was able to, to definitively say that there was no way that this man was afraid and did not actually mean to kill this woman when he went into the room. Because that's why I so. And that's why I take it the way I take it in terms of like when I said that that dude is speaking directly against Huey Newton and Malcolm X and everybody, because when I watch these things, I do feel like they're, they, they are, I feel like I can't, you know, I, when I have, well, I sometimes feel like there is that room, that conspiratorial room with the cigars and the, the, whatever the drinks and they're saying them cats that gather at BPM, we got a series for them. This is for them. We're going to do this for them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, we're going to drop little lines in there for them. And, 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 and politically speaking, we're going to do this to negate the work that they're doing. So when they walk into a room or when their video shows up in someone's algorithm and they're saying what they're saying about the police, even among a certain audience that wants to say that they agree with them, they're going to be thinking in the back of their mind, how bad could they really be? Cause I watch law and order. You know what I'm saying? Like, how right, right could those are based really on real, be? How right, you know, and those stories are based on real people. And they real even people. did a they did a real one. They did a real law and order, and it was it was real cops, and it was the real attorney, and oh, the state attorney dude, <laughs> the one that quit, the one that quit. Who can I just tell you how badly I would love to know 
like what really made him quit because he started out early in the series talking about how he realized how closely he'd be working with the police department. Right? Like that was that was his initial, you know, how close he was going to work with them, how they were going to be, you know, working hand in hand to make sure that these crimes got solved. And, you know, one has to remember that this is how the system is set up. It is set up that they make a determination before anything else happens about who the criminal was, what the crime was, what exactly happened as the crime was happening, and how they're going to pursue that particular person, right? None of those four things that I just listed have anything to do with actually resolving a crime. If you start out thinking you already know the answer, you're not going to find you. You're very unlikely to find the real answer because you're not looking for the real answer. You are looking for evidence that the thing that you decided was the answer is the answer. And it is problematic. It is yeah. problematic. Definitely wild. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last little thing that I'll point out from my list is the dude, Bob Mooney. <laughs> Wait, which one was this? He is the Irish dude that speaks Spanish. Oh, right. And who she discovered spoke Spanish in a bar. And then she goes on to say how because he is six foot three, male, white, and Irish, there's no way anybody would think that he spoke Spanish and how useful it was that he spoke Spanish. Cause if you have two perps in the car and they're talking about where they hid the gun and da, 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 and they're speaking in Spanish, he could listen in and he could, you know, he could get the facts that no one else would get because he speaks Spanish and they don't know he speaks Spanish. And once again, no one is going to talk about the fact that cops can lie. And so if nobody else in the room speaks Spanish and this dude's the only one who speaks Spanish, who who's to say that he's interpreting anything Correct. that's reality? Mm -hmm. Who's to say that what he said they said is really what they said, right? And so here we are back at this situation where you have cops who are who are presenting themselves as a thing, right? Like I speak Spanish, so therefore I can communicate with people, but that's not what he's utilizing it for. Well, so they would, their defense would be that earlier in his segment, they, they start off by saying they throw in that one line that, that covers that, which is meant to cover that, which is where he says something to the effect as I'm patrolling these black and brown communities, uh, and I'm in the community, most people are just good people doing them, just being good people. So they have that one line in there so that when you hear him or, or so by the time you, you, if you at all think about how he's proving value to him being bilingual, mm -hmm. you're like, well, he's a good, and he's the one with the Grateful Dead lapel, you know, mm -hmm. pin and all of that. He's, you know, he's, He's 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 not so bad. He's already right. told us that he's in the community working, you know, hanging out with us and 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 sees us mostly as positive. So when he's when again the one example you because he didn't say me me speaking Spanish helps me in the day to day my day to day right. routine understanding of how good these people are or how right. or how they are struggling and and taking advantage of or or whatever it's not used for that it's used to catch the two perps in the back of the seat <laughs> talking about where they hid the drugs and the guns right. and then i'm thinking is that really happening a lot i know not every criminal is a genius but is that really <laughs> happening that they're sitting in the back even thinking in spanish we're going to have a detailed conversation about where we hid the guns and drugs right i was like mm, but all right you know whatever <laughs> you know? it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy so i mean you know there was a lot of other stuff but those are the things that kind of stood out to me 
I don't want to say the most, but like in my my let me come up with a list of things that I can <laughs> utilize in this explanation of why we need to also fully understand how deep copaganda is and how whenever you are invested in these conversations with community members about policing, you have to understand how these things are playing a role in what people think they understand about policing because it all, you know, it's all working together with this stuff. Like it all feeds into it, which is what makes it so hard when you're having a conversation about armed agents of the state, as Zaruba likes to call them, or what I now like to refer to as people in costumes with guns, <laughs> right? That you have to you have to understand how to have this conversation with people because they're coming at you after they've been fully propagandized. I, I can't. This is a good one. Silberg was. This is a good. One. I do not want to watch this. And and and. But the only problem with that is that the, the as unhealthy as they are, and as in fact I haven't had one in so long. But but donuts get a bad rap being associated with police in this way. Like I feel bad for the donut. So shout out. <laughs> so shout out to to Jay Dilla, rest in peace, for bringing us back a, an appreciation for the appropriate appreciation for the donut. Um. Though I understand it didn't help with his health condition anyway. So that's why you got to leave him alone. But anyway, all right, enough of that. Um, so, one, the, uh, no, yeah, ahead. sorry. No, well, I did want to say one thing that, that I thought of was that, that John, to your point, your last point was that in that John Oliver piece that he made, he also was, not only was he talking about, well, he wasn't really making this point per se as quite in the way we are, but not only in addition to the propaganda and its impact on our communities, He's he made the point that current New York City SU SVU, I think I said I said SUV earlier, special SVU, um special victims unit, current special victims unit police officers only get five days of training in that whatever that related speciality specialty is. And they admitted apparently to a, a great, I forgot the percentage, but a, a good amount of police officers apparently report using the TV show to learn how to do their actual job. Mm. So while the show is praising itself for its authenticity and get and happy to be praised by the police that are watching it, the police are in part praising it because they're learning how to do their jobs from it. So it's it's not only teaching the world how to accept policing, but it's teaching the police how to actually do their job, which is wild. Additionally wild. I mean, that's wild. but this is, you know, I mean, it's like that's what it's 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 almost logically perfect given how media in this society are meant to work and their relationship to institutions. This is perfect. That's crazy. Let, let a let a let a let a fake show that bases itself on reality provide the reality, the training for the reality. It's like the perfect <laughs> feedback loop. It is, and and going all the way back and understanding, and there's there's a ton of videos about the you know, the history of propaganda and where it all began and understanding that that first, which I don't know why I can never remember the name of the show that was based in LA. The, I think it was like the fifties. It was the first Dragnet. Dragnet. Yeah, Dragnet. Yeah. That Dragnet was literally signed off on by the Los mm -hmm. Angeles Police Department, like literally signed off on by the LAPD. Mm -hmm. And that not an episode went forward without them determining about that episode being the correct representation of what they wanted the audience to see about police officers. So even that, when you go all the way back to that initial, you know, these are the true stories, right? Like understanding that the basis of those true stories were coming from the police department and it was all couched with that 
that like framework. So, you know, we're going decades back now, right? And the LAPD is still brought into every single Hollywood, <laughs> right? Like, it, it's amazing to me that people don't see that part of it. So that has to be part of the conversation when when you're having these conversations with people, it has to be part of the conversation that they're all built in to retelling these stories. Like the, you know, I there's an author, Lord, I'm gonna forget her name. And she did all these books and they were all based on, um, you know, it was a crime series and she was a DA. And I remember reading the books, right? And being like a fan until I found out that she was the DA behind the um, police case in Central Park. And then I had to burn all her books because I was like, oh no, we're not, <laughs> we're not, we're not doing this, right? But it takes, it takes someone being able to point those things out. Like someone saying to you, when you watch this, you have to watch it with the critical eye, right? Don't just look at this and understand that this is how interrogations go and that's how they get to the truth. Look at it and understand that they just told you they keep someone in holding and rotate in cop after cop after cop for hours and hours and hours until they get the person to say the thing that they want them to say. Right. And is that is that what you want is that what you really think is the best way <laughs> towards making sure that there is some resolution to a crime that supposedly happened or happened or allegedly happened or whatever have you? Like, is that the method that you think is, is the best method? Because what if it's you? Are you okay doing that? And how many hours would it take for you to confess to doing something that you didn't actually do if you've been sitting in a room with a rotation of people coming in and telling you lies? Like, how long would it take for you to break? Crazy. Crazy. So we can move on from the show to the real life copaganda now. So. All right. <laughs> so this is the Ole versus Adams. And the clip, mm. the, the time stamp is a long one just because it was just so delicious that I could. I oh, I see. I didn't, okay, okay. I didn't want to break it up. And I'm not like, I don't watch The Breakfast Club. Let me let me premise this, that the only reason I even took the time to find this episode was because someone shared a clip of Ole on social media. And so I was like, oh, they put Ole and Eric Adams in a room when she made like a three hour documentary where she called him the devil. <laughs> And pointed out <laughs> all the ways in which Eric Adams is a bad person, and they put them in a room together. What is what is happening? Wait, when were they in a room together? <laughs> on the Breakfast Club. This oh, she's on this. Yes. <laughs> oh snap! Okay, all right, here we go. I'm ready. You ready? So I so yeah. I will I yeah. will premise this by saying that Eric Adams, who was a police officer and then became the borough president and is now the mayor of New York City, who is currently under federal investigation for we don't really know what, um, <laughs> who I still mm. firmly believe lives in New Jersey, but okay, that's a whole other story. Mm. Um, but he is, a, you know, he is a cop supporter because he was a cop and he's still a cop. And, you know, if you ask, um, you know, some rappers, he's like, you know, the, the, the New York cop mayor, which we're not even, we're not going to even get into that going from sling, singing black cop to making up raps about him. But <clears throat> so they brought him on to breakfast club so he could talk about crime in New York and police. And, but Ole was also on. And I know people take issue with Ole with various things, but she is, she is not a everything. public, not everything. She is a public defender who lives in Flatbush who has a documented history of fighting against like the system and policing in New York City. So for whatever people want to complain about with her, that that to me, we I'm not even having that discussion if that's what we're talking about because that side of her, I fully support. I so 
No, go ahead. Were you going to say something? No, I'm just saying, all right. So yeah. We can play the clip because this is them. And it's a, it's a little bit of a long one, but this about is six minutes. Everybody it's be about good. six we, minutes, but this is her and Eric Adams fighting about like his role in policing in, in the idea of what criminality is in New York city and whether or not New York is safe or unsafe or, or whatever have you. So, all right. Realism. Mm -hmm. This far leftist mindset that believes we should not have a criminal justice system in place. Mm -hmm. We're going to look like some of these other cities that you're seeing with a lack of a criminal justice system in place. We're losing correction officers. Mm -hmm. We're losing district attorneys. We're losing police officers. We're losing probation officers. We're losing school safety agents. Every piece of our public safety apparatus that the everyday working class person wants, mm -hmm. we're seeing it all of a sudden erode. And we're going to lose the foundation of our prosperity, and that's, and that's public safety. So when you look at these cases, we have three problems in this city that if you dig into it, you'll see how they continue to intersection between each other. What are they? We have one, we have a recidivist problem. This is not we, true. We, it's a revolving door. 38 people that assaulted transit workers were, elest, were arrested 1,100 times. 545 people that were arrested for shoplifting were arrested 7,500 7, times. The person who shot that police officer, his driver was just arrested for having a gun in April of last year. Now he's back doing the same thing all over again. These guys are arrested 10, 15 times. It's a small population of people that are repeated offenders. Is... The second problem that we that we have in this in 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 this in the, in the city is a severe mental health problem. I'm not talking I about just somebody that. that's depressed, someone that's going through a bad day. I'm talking about a severe mental health problem. Go look at these cases of assaulting um, passengers, pushing people on the subway track. The cat that pushed the person on the subway track the other day. In and out of the system. Mm -hmm. And so when I came into office, I said, we can't keep just walking by these people that are dealing with severe mental health issues. We need to give them wraparound services and care. The far left pushed against me. Oh my you gosh. inhumane. You you just want to take people off the streets. That no, is, I said, no. In this city, that people, is not are not what gonna live, people are not going to live in encampments. They're going to live in tents. Go look at Los Angeles. Go look at Oregon. Go look at all these other cities where you she see tent cities. San Francisco. On. You see tent cities. People, when I went out in January, February, when I got elected in 2022, I went out without my security team and started visiting people in, in tents and encampments and started talking to them. Bipolar, schizophrenic, human waste, drug paraphernalia, stale food. They didn't even realize they were in that state. One cat was an ex-police officer that I spoke with, didn't even realize, started seeing and talking to himself. I said, I'm not going to do this. My city's not going to be like San Francisco. It's not going to be like these other cities where you're watching people living on streets in tents and tents. You don't see that in New York, in, in New York City. Third problem we have is random, um, random acts of violence. Those random acts of violence are being highlighted. If you have, if you have 24 hours in a day and something that happens to you in an hour in a day, you start to define yourself as that entire day. Those random acts of violence are plastered on social media. They're plastered on, on, the on NYPD newspapers. Twitter page. They, they're plastered on everything. People begin to believe that, oh, I'm living in a city that's out of control. We are not. She made a good that's, point, though. If New York, if NYPD is, is reposting that kind of stuff, what are we supposed to think? I said, no, 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 no. I said at the everybody, beginning. Everybody got a phone, brother. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> NYPD's page is doing this. This has recently been there so much so that they're arguing with journalists on there. It's NYPD on their own Twitter pages that are posting and sensationalizing crime. And I said this at the beginning. You said that there's a difference between perception and reality, how people feel afraid versus how safe New York actually is. And I agree with you, but I said that it's your own rhetoric and NYPD's rhetoric that plays into that. And you did it just now because the reality is a condition of release for everybody, for every crime, whether it be non-bail eligible or bail eligible, is that if you commit a crime and you're rearrested, that you uh, that you bail can and will be set on you. So that's the first thing. Second of all, they have conducted multiple studies, but the Brennan Center literally just put out one. Less than 2% of anybody in New York City that's released on bail is rearrested re for any violent crime. More importantly, in, the same, my, my in the same breath that I'm we want, in the same breath that you want to sensationalize <laughs> me, want to highlight and point out, oh, an officer was killed the other day, which is a rare occurrence across the United States, but let alone in New York. New York police 
police officers have killed at least seven people this year, including well, first, a 19 year old. First of all, first an NYPD first of all, officer killed a 19 year old in Queens dismiss, yesterday. I'm not going to dismiss the loss of a life of an innocent person that wears a uniform to protect us. But you do, us. of the a 31 rare, people rare, dead at Rikers. A rare, a rare and the 19 year old killed yesterday. I, 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 I feel like. I don't want to take you out of context, and I don't want people to all of a sudden criticize that you're being dismissive of a Ma- young Adams, man being shot Mayor and Adams, killed. Mayor Adams, that's not going to work on Listen, me. I'm not trying to broke anything yeah. on you. I'm just, I, we, I lost a member of the police department the same way I go to see the mother of the 11 year old baby that was 11 month old baby that was shot in the head when I first became mayor. And I sat in the hospital with her. The same way I go visit these mothers who lose their children to gun violence. I go see them. Yes, but just not the I, mothers of the people I, who are dying just, in Rikers. Just as I go, just as I go to see a the, the the family member of a slain police officer, I go visit those parents that lose their loved did ones to violence. Are now, you visiting you the that? family of do the? You do that? First of all, yes, I did. I held a right. You, you, I, I represented hundreds. You went to visit, you went to visit all, an, uh, the family member of, of a slain officer. No, not the slain officer. Okay, of course you no, did. No, but what about the nineteen-year-old mm-hmm. that was killed yesterday by mm-hmm. NYPD in Queens when mm-hmm. he called for help? Have you said anything <laughs> about that? Are you visiting them? Yeah, the the the. Mm. First of all, that's I'm is not New gonna... York safer or not? Mayor I'm sorry. Is New York safer or not? Okay, we sh- we just showed the graph that we that we put up, right? There's there's a graph that shows how many uh, people murders based on a hundred thousand people. They shows a graph each city, the mm-hmm. large cities in America. New York is the least. New York is the safest big city. In America, should we say crime you, is down? You can. Or you can. Say it's, <laughs> I think the difference between saying crime and not saying something is sick. It's you can pause it down. I'm still paying hundred thirty pounds, and I lose thirty. And we get caught up watching this whole thing for a long time. <laughs> so, all right. So. I understand. Oh, that you did say to stop it there. I was ready I, to keep. No, it. I it's was a, like, wow. that's because you can yeah. get, listen. It, no, and it, and it keeps yeah. going, but and. Look, I, I get that people take issue with Ole and her stance on voting and, and that, I, and I'll be honest, I didn't even finish watching the thing that she did on voting. For me, that's a separate conversation because in this particular context, this is something that is rarely, rarely seen. You rarely are getting real pushback on... <laughs> on Eric Adams and the stuff that he says and how she catches him out there after she asked him if he went to see the parents of the 19 year old that the police just killed in New York City and he's like "Uh, uh, uh." like that to me is priceless right now people can call it what they want to call it take issue whatever have you I thought it was interesting that this happened on The Breakfast Club after what happened on EYL yesterday with regard to The Breakfast Club, you know, because I I don't particularly love the show. I don't watch it, as I said. I don't tune in every morning and hear what they have to say. And I do also see that The Breakfast Club allots a space for things uh, that one must just sigh about. But I, I just felt like the clip was too good not to not to share because this is exactly part of the propaganda problem, right? You have a mayor of a city sitting on a radio show that is very, very popular that has over 5 million followers, right? And he is telling you that if we continue to lose police officers in schools, on the subway, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to erode the city. He says, quote, everyday working working class people wants, end quote, talking about the policing that regular people want. He quotes numbers of rearrests for shoplifting, because that's the major problem. We're not going to talk about how many people got their houses stolen, how many banks stole money from people, how Wall Street consistently steals money from people. Like, we're not going to talk about any of, of the things that created a society in which people have to shoplift in order to survive. We're just going to look at the shoplifting as the problem. So these are all things that I really 
I want people to engage in these conversations, right? And you don't have to use Olay if you don't like Olay, that's fine. Like find some other way to show it. And it's, you know, it's very, very interesting how these things get responded to. I, I also shared on our, on our sheet, um, there's, a, there's a link on, on line six, there's a link to a post from Twitter of someone responding to the clip that was put up by, and I don't even remember, I don't, I think maybe Ole shared it, but so this person is responding yeah, to Ole, it. right? And she's, and it says, through March 3rd, there have been three homicides in New York City subway system compared with one in the same period last year, according to police data. Overall, major crimes, including federal, federal, fel felony assaults, um, burglaries and grand, grand larcenies have increased 13% so far this year. The data shows. So how can you say that if the data shows that homicides and major crimes, ha how can you say that if the data shows that homicides and major crimes have increased? It's honest question. So this is a person who has completely fallen for it, right? And she doesn't even see how her question actually confirms everything that Ole is saying because Mayor Adams has been in place since 20, he won in 2021, right? In October, in 2022, correction. In October of 2022, they announced their big plan that they were going to increase police in the subways because that was part, him and Hochul stood together <laughs> and they were going to, they were going to increase cops in the subway system. This was in fall of 2022, right? They started that process of increasing police at the start of 2023, right? So you're saying that now, a year later, after the police have increased <laughs> in the subway system, that crime has gone up and you do not see the correlation. You don't understand that as all studies have shown, an increase in police do not reduce crime. You basically, in, in trying to call this out, confirmed exactly what the problem is. Policing does not help. It does not solve the problem. And she's so busy looking at stats and trying to, trying to point out like, oh, look, 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 look. She don't even realize that she's actually presenting an argument that completely kills everything she's trying to say because there've been more police in the police stations. So why is crime going up? Is anybody going to ask that question? <laughs> and it's something that people need to talk about. It's something that people need to talk about. Yeah, I um I see some of the the conversation in the chat, and I um, uh, so I hear what you're saying. I I actually think what what what. So on the one, well, let me say this. I think one that that Ole is a, a public defender is compelling. I think because I have a, a a pretty severe bias in defense of public defenders. Uh, and it, it, it situates her to have something competent to say about the situation. I do agree with some of my only issue really becomes. So what I would say is I would hope that to satisfy some of what I see in the chat and my own contradictions here, I, I hope that she would continue to the extent that she doesn't. And I don't know enough about her content to engage, uh, those on her political left as well as she is, as much as she's willing to engage, obviously her her fellow whatever lane she's in and then those to her right as is the case here uh i think there was a legit question raised as to why would the breakfast club see her as being a, a welcomed participant in this exchange um and what is it that they find safe in her politics i think that's a legit question but i think mm -hmm. the um yeah i just but i think that the the but I think what, but to your point, I think it is good to see her be challenged. And I think that in terms of a breakfast club, that is the most that we could expect. Um, the only other issue that I ever have with this is that is, is when, when appearances like this can position someone who does not have left or to what extent they don't have 
far left politics as the legit spokesperson for left politics. So, and that's why I'm saying I encourage Ole to engage lawyers involved in, to the extent that she's not, and I don't know, uh, like, uh, pub, um, political prisoner work or s- sort of other left forms, formations of, of, of uh, the legal community uh, and be willing to talk to people to her left on her show. Which, That's it. Which to my, to my knowledge, she does. So, cause I do, you know, I, I do watch, watch her stuff and I, I get people's and it is true the the reality of the situation is there are certain people who are going to be allowed to be platformed and certain people who are not going to be allowed to be platformed. And they're not going to, somebody just said in the chat, like, let them have Kamau on. They're not bringing Kamau on because Kamau is going to go on there and blow up too much stuff that they can't be having. <laughs> well, Geechee showed, I mean, we've, we've so. showed the text messages where, you know, cause Geechee grew up with, with Charlemagne. So, and he's right. shown me the text messages where they where they're like, T- we're not talking taking about it that me. Far. And right. Like we're not having. In, in we're not my, taking it that know. far. There's, so, they, they have their know. line in the sand for what they're going to cross and what they're not going to cross, and it is it is problematic. I don't, but I don't know how to fix that part. The only, you know, the only thing that I can say is you can utilize some things in these conversations when you are trying to point out to people the realities of propaganda and policing and the multiple roles that think that people are playing within convincing the general community that policing is a good thing, right? Like I, all you can do is try your best to point out these things when they're happening so that you can have a real conversation about those things. So as far as her being vote blue, she she cannot even vote. So like I really like I want people to also be clear. She's not a citizen. She cannot vote in this country. She cannot. So even you know, if you want to disregard her part of that conversation of politics, and again, I say with the disclaimer that I didn't watch that full thing that she did yeah. on voting, right? So I mean, she put you know, herself out there as having something did. to say. He put herself, it, so. but she also put herself out there as, as mm. someone to, to having something to say on Palestine. And she said that okay. she couldn't even get a she couldn't even get a guest on because people were so afraid of what was going to happen if they did an entire show with her about Palestine. But she's also looking to the wrong people to have as guests because Clearly. that's right because that's part of the issue. So I don't really know. I don't know how to address people's issues with her contradictions. My goal in showing the clip was to show someone calling out Eric Adams, who is part of the propaganda machine because he is a cop and he is always going to support. And he cops. ran that line. She called and him he out ran on that it. line. And so. So one question is. I have is, is cause I always go back and forth. So I was, as I was watching that one, one thought I had was. A would the breakfast club have invited her on just as a solo guest to talk about her her politics and views of the mayor and is the and then two is there any even real value in having those exchanges and and i'm just thinking selfishly that i always do so poorly in in a, in that kind of commercial media debate space that 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 I would have to see how well she did over the course of the whole thing, that I, I think it's a real challenge. And even when you do well, I'm not even sure w- what the value, or if it's as valuable as we think it may be. Um, she seems to have done very well there, but I am wondering if the Breakfast she's, Club- She's been on have, before, she was on, on before, yeah, she was on solo to talk about Rikers and mm. um, like the this battle that's been happening in New York City regarding that, but I, you know, Anyway, I don't I don't want to get into a whole thing about her. Like that wasn't yeah, yeah, really no, my yeah. whole purpose. <laughs> so And no, yeah. and he was there definitely to run run the game. Right. And right. Um and then the same my, again, I had a similar feeling like when Charlemagne starts trying to act like he's uh you know, the hard hitting progressive journalist challenging the the mayor. Um I, yeah, I always really struggle with that, but but it is good to it as as a lesson in propaganda. I definitely agree with you that this that there is right. value in that clip right there for right. sure. Yeah. And so, going even further about Rikers, there is also mm. <laughs> on her sheet mm. 
baptism via Rikers. Like there is an actual press coverage. I saw this. This this, this is wild. wild, 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 wild. Shout wild, out wild. to the remixing community, and because I, I always love when this happens when multiple people send me these, the same thing, and it's like there's like a zeitgeist in the remixing community. This was one of them. So I got this from the Daily Mail here. New York City Mayor Eric Adams baptized by civil rights campaigner, the Reverend Al Sharpton during Good Friday visit to notorious Rikers Island Jail. So, but I almost, and I admit as much as I think I'm politicized and in opposition to these folks, I admit I, I am still at times like this one, shocked at the audacity audacity <laughs> <I know. laughs> like you really went to rikers to do this <laughs> but without and then talking, i'm thinking if i'm locked up on up. rikers if i'm locked up on rikers <laughs> and <laughs> let me just stop there before i get us all locked up and canceled I, and shut down but i just Son. like this is this is for real though like this is for real with the pictures and the washing of the feet and the, and I am just blown away that this press coverage is happening at a happening at a place that is so overrun with people who have not been found guilty of a crime. So if I'm him right here, this was the I think this was the picture where I had my little political fantasy. If I'm him right here really this is what i want out of your visit and you're making a very good point <laughs> he hadn't even been convicted of a crime yet and he's standing here in his tan jumpsuit is he praying is he is, did, did he I get baptized too was it like a collective know. i don't know i don't know but i was thinking i saw this picture or something i think that was the one and i just went on i went into a whole get you banned from YouTube, get the FBI showing up at your door, thought fantasy. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I just don't, you yeah. And this is, this is the thing, right? Like, this is what you went to Rikers to do. And this is what the press came in to watch happen. And this is what you had people who have been in Rikers for who knows how much time, right? Who, who got allowed to come see this nonsense? Right, he got nerve to have red, black, and green in here I, too. My listen, bad. you, you, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, man. But it's crazy, and this is so. This is this is the takeaway, right? And is anyone going to talk about the reality of Rikers? Is anyone going to talk about the fact that there are thousands more people in that space? than are than it was actually built to hold. Khalif is any, Browder is right. Is anyone about. going to talk about Khalif Browder? Is anyone going to talk about as was stated the 31 people who have died at Rikers since Eric Adams became mayor? How many? 30, 31. 31. Are we going to talk about the fact that that entire space is under federal investigation? Because it should not, like, there's a whole, invest, like, everything about Rikers is wrong. Everything. Mm. But we're not going to talk about that at all. We're going to talk about the mayor going there with Al Sharpton and, and getting baptized on, on site because that's, that's the important thing. That's the thing. Can I find it real quick? Because there was this clip where... Yeah, let me let me. Can I show this? Yeah, clip? yeah, go ahead. I, I know go. we didn't pull it, but this is this is back when I used to like Democracy Now. Or before I fully stopped liking Democracy Now. Maybe I should put it that way. This do you do you all remember this? Is this? I think this is the right. Clip. Two decades ago, that movie mogul Harvey Weinstein allegedly assaulted actress Rose McGowan. McGowan told the New York Times in October, Weinstein Hold offered on, where's that clip? Wait, this is about Weinstein, but I want to... About Khalif, the, yeah, here we go. able to age 16, Khalif Brown. Jay-Z's docuseries, Weinstein was at Sundance and attended the Women's March here. 
Weinstein was in town promoting Jay-Z's docu-series, Time, the Khalif Browder story about New York City teenager Khalif Browder, who committed suicide in 2015 after being sent to Rikers jail at age 16 and held for three years, much of that time, in solitary confinement. Last year, I was able to speak to Jay-Z about Khalif, about Rikers, until Harvey Weinstein ended the interview. Do you think Rikers should be closed? Oh, man. Uh, well, if anything like that is happening, if, one, if that happens to one kid, any place that that can happen to any kid should be closed. In your thoughts on Donald Trump and what it means for mass, or, or no, what it, guys, what it means yeah, for mass incarceration? Go. You know what? We, this is a labor of love for Jay, no, and as a result, he's my friend. We're here to talk about that and nothing else. Well, then can I ask you about so I just wanted to, right. okay, so it, it, to be fair, right. my memory, the, the cutoff was more connected to Khalif Browder. Maybe it was, maybe in that mm -hmm. sense it was Trump, but, it but, was but, Trump. but, but yeah, well, so, so, but I was, I thought I, in my, I was thinking, yeah, that, that Weinstein of all people wouldn't want a, a, a real discussion of Rikers being shut down, but I think it, it, it did look like it was more the Trump thing. Uh, it was probably on, on a combination view, but, of the but, two. But a combination, honest, like Jay, and you can see how Jay-Z, like, a man of millions of words who never writes his lyrics, who freestyles <laughs> everything, was stuck. Right. How do I how do I get out of this one? Even he was like, uh, uh, but he right. he you know, he you right. know he right. said it should be closed. And it's and it's tough, right? Because a lot of people would not even understand. Right, Jay is my friend. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. People Jay wouldn't understand the 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 history of the Khalif Browder story or what happened to him or any of that if that documentary series hadn't been made and on Netflix, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so much of a contradiction with all of these things. Like how do you how do you figure out which way to go? Right? Like how do you figure out which one <laughs> like how it's so hard to make sense of of how to really fight this battle because every angle is against you making sense of it. But that's the point, right? Like they want you to on one side be looking at the Khalif Browder story and be upset and bothered by what happened to that young man. But then at the same time, they want you to be excited because the mayor went to Rikers and, and got baptized by Al Sharpton. Wow. So there's one last story that if you want to pull the um because this is just this is another situation Which of it, it's the using the law to protect cops. It's an Al Jazeera story. And I, I threw this in there this morning because <laughs> I read it and I was just like how hey. US police are co-opting a law meant to protect victims of crime. All right. So what's happening here? So what's going on is, you know, there are laws in place that are supposed to protect victims. And they are now using those laws to protect cops who have participated in situations where they were the victimizers. And it's just, you know, it's 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 the same it's the same issue. Like, how do you how do you have these conversations? How do you have these conversations with real people and get them to understand that th this is the system? Like, this is this is what it does. So wait, she was suspected. Wait, wait, wait. She was suspected of stealing from a Kroger's grocery this store, is, and you thought young, that was this, worthy of gunplay. This was the young lady who got shot to death in Columbus, Ohio, in the parking lot last summer. Oh wow. Okay. over shoplifting even i mean again even if she had done it so what what do we need guns for that for and she was terrified like when they showed the video you know because people of course were like well why didn't she get out of the car and you know that's always the response why didn't she why did she resist why didn't she follow directions right and and now they're utilizing a, a victim's law to to hide and shield police officers who who are you know found to be have played a role in something damaging to somebody in the community
So a law that was put into existence in order to protect regular people is now going to be utilized to protect police officers. And all you can well, do is like, uh, shake your yeah, head. Like, what, what, yeah, <laughs> I, the only thing I could come up with, it, I, you know, is that the, that public policy is impacted and helped to to be brought into effect by the way it's framed in in popular discourse. So it 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 makes perfect sense that these kinds of laws can be turned around and twisted or developed into doing what you're just describing, uh, in part because the zeitgeist in defense of, of those institutions has been aided by all this copaganda. Right. So uh, it, it becomes like the protective shield or the blunt force that paves the way for the nonsensical arguments of Mayor Adams, of, of Reverend Sharpton, of... Uh, whoever. So... Yeah, that's wild. It's that's crazy. Wild. It's all craziness. Um, so um, we had invited uh, Taya Graham to come on, y'all, just so you know, from um, the police accountability report. And it was, it was, I was having a hard, I, I wish I knew that you had actually, actually known her because I would have made you start bugging her yeah. earlier to see. Yeah, it. I can. It might we, just we, be we, a cross. We, we, We'll have to reach out. Taya Graham and Stephen Janice were were. I'll admit. I mean, I have no. You know, I, I'm. I don't. I don't have a problem with it. Is that they were two of the the few good people that I I got to work with at the Real News for the year that I was there. Right. And and, uh, and, and uh, yeah. And their show police accountability report. Um, because someone did ask in the chat, like, well, where do you go to you know to see like real police stories? That's a great place to go <laughs> to see real police stories. Um, because they actually break down the full account of of what happened, um, you know, as whatever was going on. The most recent one is, you know, they finally got the police to release. Um, the footage from a neighborhood in Baltimore where, you know, they just started wilding and arresting everybody that was on the And then the remember, <laughs> speaking of Jay-Z, Jan Stephen Janice, oddly enough, has a lot to do with the beginnings of the, the history behind the uh, It's a Hard Knock Life Annie beat. Because wow. Janice has a whole musical background and was working with 45 King, rest in peace, and put and was was the producer behind that and was involved with the DJ Cool for us DC area folks. Uh, the DJ Cool, uh, uh, um, let me clear my throat. Mm -hmm. So Stephen mm -hmm. Janice, oddly enough, has his own little hip hop go-go history. So yeah, Taya and Steven are some some interesting people because because speaking of what we were saying about the dude and the Grateful Dead and all that, Steven Janis, you would look at him and never ever think he has an association with Jay Z and and DJ Cool, but yeah. you never know. You see, never know. See what you learn when you listen to <laughs> Dick Wolf. <laughs> You never know. Oh, you never know. You never know. So I would so, yeah. I would suggest people that go watch that. We'll see if we can circle back. Um, you know, my my hope had initially been also to have Taya participate in that conversation about why why she does things the way she does it. Cause I think, you know, that I they're definitely not getting the same amount of views <laughs> that um <laughs> that Charlemagne's getting, right? Like they're not getting that type of of visibility because they are pointing out the realities of the system and the realities of what happens when you have to deal with police officers. And that's just not that's not popular. Like that's not what, you know, the the mainstream wants you to understand. So and I highly recommend that. It's on the Real News Network. Um, and I just I think people should, you know, also be pointing people to watch that stuff as well. Um for real, you know, real, 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 <laughs> real, real news, real, real, real news. news. <laughs> All right. So, 
anything you want to announce before we we get our stretch and hydration on for warrior class uh, i don't i i don't think there is um i was invited to speak um and actually i think ricky's going to be on the same panel that i'm going to be on um to talk about cop cities and and various things that communities could be doing um to combat that that's coming up in it's this weekend in uh, I don't want to lie. <sighs> it might be Minnesota. I don't want to lie though, but I'm not going there. I'm going to be, I'm going to be virtual. Cause I, you know, I can't travel. <laughs> I ain't got it like that to be traveling all over the place. Um, and for people in New Jersey, if you are interested, we do have some seats coming available in our monthly abolition conversations. So people can hit me if they have any interest in, in that, um, because we'll have some space available for people to participate. Um, so that's been pretty good. So that's it. That's all I got. All right. Well, right on, everybody. Please, you know, thanks to to everyone who's here now and who will see this later. Peace to you as well, if you're willing to fight for it, as Fred Hampton used to say. Stay tuned for Warrior Class here on BPM and come back tomorrow for Sundays. And make sure you have the bell rung, because you never know. I at least never know when things are coming. So uh, if you have the bell rung, you always get your nice little notification. You don't have to remember anything. It makes everything easier. So just go ahead and do it. Right. <laughs> Peace. Renee, thank you very much. Peace, everybody. Again, only if you're willing to fight for it, as Fred Hampton used to say. And we'll catch you next week right here on Saturday with Renee. With Renee.